We knew that Flat Earth would have to make it into the rotation eventually. I'm Aiden Mattis, and welcome back to the Lore Lunch. I don't know if it's just that I'm on the younger side of life, or if this is something that sort of erupted in the last few years, but I remember that growing up, I didn't see a ton of stuff about the Flat Earth. At least, not stuff that took it seriously. You'd have TV shows and movies make jokes about it, you'd see somebody making a meme, you'd see it as some sort of reference for a ridiculous conspiracy, but in the last few years, and like I said, maybe it is just because I'm on the internet now more than I was when I was in high school, I've seen a lot of people who seem to very seriously believe that the Earth is not a sphere. There are several different reasons why people seem to attach themselves to this theory, uh, several different entry points. Some people start with the moon landing, and they think the moon landing is fake, and that drives them to believe the Earth is flat in and of itself, and that's why we didn't get to the moon. Others point to the Bible and claim that the Bible, as well as all of the other ancient religions, all say that the Earth was flat, and this only changed sometime in the last several hundred years, so clearly at some point somebody tried to hide it from us. But even in giving a couple of examples like that, it doesn't quite capture the scope of what flat eartherism is. Because this is not necessarily one distinct, clear set of beliefs. It seems that flat eartherism changes depending on who you're talking to. Different people have different motivations today. As with many conspiracy theories, whether you're looking at the disappearance of MH370, or if you're looking at Tartaria, there are a number of different versions of it. Nobody is in perfect total agreement. But they all do tend to agree on a few of the same core aspects. With Flat Earthers, when it comes to what they believe about the Earth, well, it's flat, stationary, enclosed by an ice wall at the edges with a solid dome above, and Earth is typically at the center of the universe. As for the various celestial bodies, the sun, the moon, the stars, all of the other planets, those are typically either underneath or within the structure of the dome itself, and they're not out in the vast expanses of space. They're also perceived to be local, although the extent to which they are local varies. In some cases, they're only 3,000 miles away, in some cases it's more, and in some less. This tends to be because of differing beliefs on where the dome actually is and what the Earth actually looks like. Some flat earthers believe that the ice expands in all directions endlessly, forever, and that the dome is up over top of that, which has its own logical inconsistencies that we can get to later, but for now we're just going to move on past that. Others believe that the circumference of the Earth is actually a diameter of the Earth. So it would still be about 25,000 miles, but rather than that wrapping around, it goes from point A to point B across a flat map. Now, if you look at a lot of ancient maps of the world, and we're talking, you know, really early maps, a lot of the time this is what they look like, where there is the land is all at the center clustered around in a circle, and then there's water beyond it. If you look at most Flat Earth maps from the 1800s, they are going to give you basically the world map as we know it, the main difference is that it's not a globe, it's, it's just a flat plane. Now, when most people try to address the concept of Flat Earth in the 21st century, they'll try and take a scientific angle. They'll try and use mathematical proofs to show that the Earth is round and that this cannot be questioned. But I wanted to start somewhere else. I didn't want to look at the, the specific modern beliefs. I wanted to understand how Flat Eartherism developed. How did people come to believe that something so objectively false is true. And I know that if you believe the Earth is flat, that statement probably turns you off. You probably don't want to finish watching the video. You're probably writing a comment right now as I'm speaking saying that I'm not open-minded and I'm not considering all the possibilities, or if you're more conspiratorial, that I am some globalist controlled shill who's just trying to hide the truth from you, and that the Masonic Bible on my bookshelf is proof of that. In reality, the Masonic Bible, which may or may not be out of frame right now, is just a King James Red Letter Bible. There's nothing special about it, it doesn't say anything that your King James Bible doesn't. But, as I was on Twitter arguing about this over the last few weeks, almost everybody accused it of being some Masonic conspiracy run by the Jews. And what I want to start with in this video is, you know, going over the history. Where did the Flat Earth begin? Why did people start to believe this again? And what evidence, if any at all, will Flat Earth believers be willing to accept to prove that they are wrong? 
So in this video, my goal is not to deride the common flat earther. It's not to insult people who are just simply out there in the audience. It's to address the arguments made by the people leading the movement, by those who are literally profiting off of the misrepresentations they are giving to others. And I believe that the best place to start, if we want to do that, if we want to get to the bottom of what flat eartherism is, is with the history of the movement, and with the history of astronomy in general. But, just in case anybody does not take what I promise are well-intentioned efforts very well, I did think it might be best to scrub all of my personal information off of the internet first. And that's why I wanted to introduce you to our partner for today's video, Delete Me. Are you familiar with the phrase, if the product is free, you are the product? That's typically used in relation to things like social media, free online guides, and stuff like that. And that's because your data is sold to online data brokers. Thing is, you actually have the legal right to privacy of your personal information. That means that you can actually contact data brokers and request, or really demand, that they remove your information from their sites, from their listings, to protect you from identity theft, phishing scams, and other risk areas. Now, in some cases, when your data is sold, it's just to a marketing firm that's going to send you emails about, I don't know, Medicare or something like that. But oftentimes, it will be purchased by people who don't have the best of intentions. And through your data, they might be able to find data that compromises family members or friends, your mother's maiden name, where you went to high school, things that are often used as security questions and passwords. So, in order to protect those you love, it's helpful to have a security service that you can trust. And that's why we like Delete Me, a hands-free subscription service that removes your personal information from data brokers online. They have privacy experts who are real people who will go through the listings and make sure that your information gets taken down all year long for the life of your subscription. And when you get started with Delete Me, you can get your first privacy report in just seven days. This will tell you where your information is and give you the direct resources to have Delete Me's team get rid of things like email addresses, phone numbers, and even home addresses. They will also monitor these sites to ensure that your data doesn't just pop back up a couple of weeks later. And if there's something that they don't catch, you can always make a custom removal request. Delete Me's mission is simple, to remove customers' information from search results. They believe that you have the right to own, manage, and remove your personal data. And since the ways companies collect, share, and sell your data are constantly changing, they believe that you need a team and a program, a service, that is constantly adapting to the market as it plays. That's why they created an online privacy solution that evolves and constantly improves to address these challenges. If you like to try Delete Me, you can use our special relationship with these guys to get 20% off any consumer plan using the code LORELODGE. To take advantage of this offer, you can simply go to joindeleteme.com slash lorelodge or go to the link in our description. Once again, that is joindeleteme.com slash lorelodge or code lorelodge to get 20% off any consumer delete me plan. Now we just hope that the flat earthers don't delete me for this video. Once upon a time, the idea that the Earth is flat was not so derided as it is today. In fact, many ancient societies around the globe believed that the Earth was a flat disk, a rectangle, or an infinite plane of some kind. In Asia, the Chinese, for example, believed that the Earth was flat. Specifically, that it was a flat square with a round dome over top, sometimes described as a sphere which enclosed the Earth that was a square. Now, in the case where it was a sphere, it wasn't the Earth that was a sphere, it was the, the cosmos above. Across the Pacific, Native Americans held varying views on the substance of the planet, often related to their flood stories. But what they typically didn't seem to care about all that much was the shape of the planet itself. They didn't really talk about it being flat or round. Certain groups, like the Algonquian tribes, believed that the Earth had simply sprung up from the bottom of the ocean via supernatural means. Sometimes there's a turtle that pulls it up, and this is where we get the concept of Turtle Island. Other times there's a muskrat that pulls it up. It really changes depending on the tribe. In fact, in certain versions, like the, the Navajo, don't seem to have this creation cosmology at all. It's totally different. Moving into more familiar territory with Near and Middle Eastern cosmologies, you did typically have a flat Earth. Often it was perceived as us living on a disk of land, or at least a disk of land masses, that were adrift in an endless sea, or sometimes a limited ocean. 
The Egyptians, for example, believed in a flat disk of land sitting in the middle of an expansive ocean with a hard dome over top that held the sun, stars, and moon. The Israelite view is often suggested to be the same, a belief in a flat earth with a domed roof over top of it. We will circle back to the Israelite view later on because it's a little bit more complicated than that makes it seem, but for now I want to keep moving through where we are at the moment. And where we are right now is the Mediterranean Sea, which was pretty much the domain of the Greeks for a long time. And for much of Greek history, up through a lot of the classical period even, they held similar views to the Egyptians. Some argued for a flat disk with water around a circular landmass, while others claimed that the planet was suspended in the air, and others still suggesting it was on a pillar of some kind. In any of these cases, the Earth's surface as we know it still would be a flat disk. As far as we know, however, it was probably the Greeks, possibly with Egyptian influence, who first began to question the idea that the Earth was flat. Part of the issue is that we're not precisely sure when this started to happen. We just know that most people consider Plato to be the first person to make a claim that the Earth is in fact a sphere. However, this is something that Plato started saying only after he returned to Athens from his time in Magna Graecia, specifically the city of Croton, where he was studying Pythagorean mathematics. So this could suggest that Pythagorean mathematics is in fact the origin of belief in a spherical Earth. Though, because Pythagoras had quite a bit of influence from ancient Egypt, it could also suggest that the Egyptians were beginning to come to this conclusion as well. A possible source of evidence for this claim that the Egyptians believed this as well, and that they were the impetus for the Greeks looking into it, comes from Herodotus, who in his histories tells of an expedition sent by the Egyptians around Africa. Allegedly, sometime around the year 600 AD, the pharaoh Necho II hired some Phoenician sailors to depart from the Red Sea, go around Libya, which was at the time what they called Africa, and return to Egypt through the pillars of Heracles and then by coming up the Nile. Allegedly, what happened is that the Phoenician sailors embarked into the Red Sea, sailed south, and turned west to go around the tip of Africa. And then, as they were heading due west, they looked up into the sky and saw that the sun, oddly enough, was on their right side. And what's particularly interesting about this account from Herodotus, and what makes us think that it might have some merit to it, is that Herodotus isn't telling this as something that happened and was fantastical in this incredible journey. Instead, he's actually doubting that it happened at all because the sun should have been on their left. Because, as far as anybody knew at the time, if you were sailing west, the sun was always on your left. Of course, today we know that the reason the sun is on your left as you're sailing west in the northern hemisphere is because the sun is to your south. When you're heading west in the southern hemisphere, the sun is to your north. For the Greeks, who lived entirely north of the Tropic of Cancer, the sun was always distinctively to the left when you headed west and to the right when you headed east. So, for it to be to the right seemed impossible to them. They had literally never experienced a situation where you could be heading west and have the sun to your right. While historians today are unsure if Herodotus invented this story or if it actually passed to him through oral tradition as he claimed, it could be that Pythagoras, while studying in Egypt, heard about this expedition and brought that story back with him to Italy. And there, his students would have studied and tried to figure out, was the Earth actually round? Whatever was going on over there, it seems like it convinced Plato, who brought it with him back to Greece, Athens specifically, but the problem there is that Plato didn't really leave anything in the way of mathematical reasoning for us to follow. That task seems to have fallen to Aristotle, Plato's best-known protege and the tutor of future ruler Alexander the Great. Aristotle did claim that the Earth was a sphere, and while he did not provide a mathematical proof, he did provide a pretty bulletproof astronomical reason. Aristotle had done some traveling himself, and he also had read multiple travelogues of people who had gone up and down between Greece and Egypt, and what he found was that these contained mentions of stars and sometimes even constellations that were visible in one place but not the other. He also observed that constellations visible in the southern sky from Athens appeared higher in the sky at night if you traveled south to Egypt. And in observing lunar eclipses, he found that the Earth's shadow on the moon was round. It wasn't endless, it wasn't a flat square or anything like that. It was round. So, because there were stars visible in Egypt that one could not see in Macedon, there were constellations which appeared higher further to the south than they did to the north, and because the Earth's shadow on the moon during an eclipse was round, he determined that the Earth must, by logical reasoning, be round, be spherical. It's spherical! <laughs> spherical! <laughs> 
Aristotle also offered two estimations about the Earth in regards to it being round, those being that it was 400,000 stadia in circumference, or 45,000 miles, which was not correct. And as far as the climate of the Earth goes, he also suggested that there were probably two cold polar regions, two warmer temperate regions, and then a tropical zone in the middle. Today, we consider these to be six. There's two polar, two temperate, and two tropical, and then the equator. But for all intents and purposes, Aristotle was right. There is a zone around the equator that is generally tropical. Today, we just call these the tropics of Capricorn and Cancer. Now, I think it's also important to give you a timeline on when these people lived and what was going on in the world at the time. Plato lived from 427 BC, thereabouts, to around 347 BC, and Aristotle from 384 BC to 322 BC. And this is the end of the classical era of Greek history. This is the era most people think of when they think ancient Greece, the democracy of Athens, the Battle of Thermopylae, the Peloponnesian and Persian Wars, the ancient Greek philosophers. That is the classical period. Socrates on down to Aristotle. All of the stuff that you remember about ancient Greece from high school probably took place during that period. The major change, what ended the classical era, was not just the progressive works of the great philosophers changing the way that Greek culture worked, but also the actions of a man by the name of Alexander of Macedon. Alexander of Macedon, properly Alexander III of Macedon, or most commonly known as Alexander the Great, was the son of Philip II of Macedon, who went about doing something Macedonians really hadn't done before and conquering Greece. They discovered something very similar to what the French discovered during the medieval period, which is that horses good in battle. He also discovered something that the English of the Middle Ages discovered, which is that very long spear also good in battle. Philip II used very long spear and man on horse to conquer much of what is Greece proper, and then Alexander used very long spear and man on horse to conquer basically the entire known world after that. What I mean by that is that in 335 BC, Alexander III of Macedon began a series of conquests that would spread Greek culture across basically the entirety of the known world east of Sicily. In this period where everything was Greek to everyone was called the Hellenistic Era. This may be one of our first lingua franca situations in history, where one language becomes the language of the elite, the language of math and science and technology, and at that time it was Koine Greek. What this did for the sciences was create an unprecedented opportunity for the sharing of knowledge across cultural and national boundaries. It also meant that you had Greek thinkers coming into direct contact with Egyptian technology, Egyptian history, Egyptian religion, in a way that was a lot more intimate than ever before. And one example of one of these Greek thinkers who ended up surrounded by Egyptian everything was Eratosthenes, who lived from around 276 to around 194 BC. So this is a guy who was living through basically the rise of the Roman Republic as well. Around the year 240 BC, Eratosthenes, who was working and living in Alexandria, Egypt, heard about this well in Syene, Egypt, which was about 5,000 stadia away. And what he had heard about this well is that during a particular time of the year, at noon, the sun would shine directly straight down into the well. There would be no shadow to the sides. You could see clear to the bottom because the sun was directly overhead. And using that information, he conducted an experiment where, by measuring a shadow in Alexandria, at the same time he knew that there would be no shadow in Syene, he was able to demonstrate the distance between those two points on a circle. The distance he gave was 242,000 stadia, which we're not sure exactly what the dimensions he was using were, because there are mentions to the ratio of er Eratosthenes, so we think his stadia may have been slightly different from what we tend to think of. Stadia ranged, because it, it, basically up until the metric system existed, there weren't really standard units of measurement. The imperial system wasn't even perfect. Like, the imperial system is very standard now, but it was not 300 years ago. Point of the matter is, accounting for the variation in how long Stadia could be, they determined that his measurement equaled somewhere between 24 and 29,000 miles, which basically means he was spot on. That's the right answer. We ultimately were able to actually measure the circumference of the Earth, and it turns out it's 24,901 miles. So, Eratosthenes could have been completely correct. 
he, he could have actually been spot on, but either way, he was definitely in the neighborhood, far more than you would expect somebody to be. Unfortunately, the exact method by which Eratosthenes did this has been lost, and much of what we know about it comes from a simplified version produced by Cleomedes. Sorry for the looking at the notes, but I couldn't remember how to pronounce the name off my... I, I couldn't remember if there was an N. His version survived, and it suggests that the method involved measuring shadows in different locations 5,000 stadia apart at the same time of day, noon. And what he found was, since the angle of these shadows, which of course there was no shadow in Syene, but the angle of the shadow in Alexandria from a pole he erected was about 7 degrees at noon. Since 7 degrees is approximately 1 51st of a circle, he just did 5,000 stadia times 51, and he got around 252,000 stadia. Technically, I think that adds up to 255,000 stadia, but there's also some, some stuff to do with the, the way that numbers worked and the fact that 252,000 is divisible by every number between 1 and 10, so that may be why he chose to work with 252,000, because it was just a simpler number to divide and multiply with. Like, they, they weren't going to space. They didn't need to be super exact. They just had to have a general idea of how far they needed to travel and what kind of supplies they needed to bring. This was important because the reasoning of Aristotle for why the Earth was a sphere, combined with the mathematical proof of the circumference created by Eratosthenes, gave the world a new way, or at the very least cemented a developing way, of looking at everything. Rather than this being a flat disk of unknown scale, it was a sphere of known proportion. And as I said a few minutes ago, this was during the ascendancy of the Roman Republic. So as Rome just sort of absorbed the Hellenistic world to its east, they adopted these same beliefs about the proportions and shape of the Earth. It's also possible that the Romans came to this conclusion even earlier, considering that the Pythagorean academies that came up with this were in southern Italy. Now, of course, in 500 BC, when Pythagoras lived, Rome was a tiny kingdom up in central Italy and definitely didn't extend south. By the third century, it certainly did. Eventually, Rome would go on to conquer, essentially, the known civilized world, and, as a result, the educated people of the known civilized world, at least in Rome's sphere, fully believed the Earth was a sphere. What wasn't known and wasn't proven at the time was where the Earth actually fit into the structure of the universe. At the time of people like Eratosthenes and even Aristotle, it was believed that the Earth was the center of the universe, that everything was going on around us, whether we were on a flat disk or if we were a round ball, everything was centered on the Earth. The sun, the moon, the stars, they all went in a circle around the Earth. And this concept of a universe with Earth at its center lasted a lot longer than the belief in Flat Earth did. And when I say it lasted a lot longer, I mean nearly two millennia. However, even back during the BC period, there were challenges to this paradigm. Today, everybody knows about Galileo, and most people are at least familiar with the names Copernicus and Kepler. But these were far from the first people to suggest a heliocentric model, or a belief that the Sun, in fact, was at the center of, at the very least, our solar system, if not the universe. Much as with Plato and the spherical Earth, it seems very possible that Pythagorean scholars were the first to suggest a model of the universe where Earth was not at the center. The first individual, so far as we are aware, to posit a heliocentric model of the universe was Aristarchus of Samos, who lived during the 3rd century BC. Now, we only know of the work of Aristarchus through Archimedes, who himself was a contemporary of both Aristarchus and Eratosthenes. What Archimedes tells us is that Aristarchus believed that it was the Earth that moved, not the Sun. Specifically, he believed that the Sun and stars were in fixed positions overhead, while the Earth orbited around the Sun in a circle and rotated on its own axis. 3rd century BC. Then, in the 2nd century, the Seleucid astronomer Seleucos, or Seleucos of Seleucia, put forward his own version of the theory. Unfortunately, like Aristarchus, we only know about uh, Seleucus's discoveries through the works of other authors. However, when I say other authors, I'm talking about contemporaries. I'm not talking about people 500 years later, just to be clear. And while it seems that Seleucus generally put forward the same theory as Aristarchus, he also added a belief that the universe was not fixed or set in place, but rather infinite. But despite the best efforts of Aristarchus and Seleucus, most people of the time seem to have held to the Aristotelian geocentric model, which would later be improved upon with the Ptolemaic model of the 2nd century AD. 
There are a few key differences between the Aristotelian and Ptolemaic models, but the one that I think is probably the most important to our discussion right now is that Aristotle put forward a stationary spherical Earth at the center of a universe of further spheres concentric to one another, while Ptolemy put forward an Earth that revolves in a small circle around the true center of the universe. Ptolemy's cosmology remained the standard for over a thousand years until a late medieval polymath by the name of Nicolaus Copernicus set another revolution into motion. See what I did there? A member of the Polish mercantile class, Copernicus became a canon of the Catholic Church and went into the sciences. He was known for advances in several fields, including economics, but the most famous contribution he made was to the field of astronomy. Copernicus put forward a model where the Earth, as well as all of the other planets in the universe, all six of them revolved around the sun, which was, of course, at the center of the universe. I will be honest, Copernicus was not as close as they presented him to us in high school. Copernicus also pulled off the most hardcore version of the uh, will you elaborate on that no meme ever by dropping his heliocentric theory in 1543 and then dying of a stroke the same year. Believe it or not, Eraserhead is my most spiritual film. Mm -hmm. uh, why, why, we'll elaborate on that. No, I won't. Um, <laughs> But had Copernicus lived, there would have been some pretty hardcore debates between him and a guy by the name of Giovanni Maria Tolosoni. Copernicus being dead meant that Tolosoni was basically doing the old man yells at cloud meme, arguing that Copernicus was using math to try and prove his point like a naughty little boy. Tolosoni's objections didn't really do a ton during the, the exact time period when he was making them, and the Catholic Church only really started to crack down on this whole heliocentrism thing in the 1600s. And that's partially because in 1609, Johannes Kepler built upon the Copernican model by demonstrating that planets moved in elliptical orbits around the sun, among other things formerly known as Kepler's laws of planetary motion. Fortunately for Kepler, nobody really gave a damn until 1610 when Galileo Galilei decided there just wasn't enough beef in the astronomy fandom. He presented troubling new observations, such as moons around Jupiter. But what Galileo did that was so important was essentially demonstrate that there were other bodies in space that had things orbiting around them, Jupiter had moons, and he also observed Venus orbiting the sun, which proved that things orbited stuff other than Earth. He also saw mountains on the moon. The Jesuits were immediately displeased with Galileo's arguments and findings, and they argued against him until they looked through telescopes and realized he was right. In the years that followed, the Catholic Church argued with Galileo about things like gravity and mostly used the Bible as the source of their arguments. Which brings me to, well, the, the modern Flat Earth movement. The world gradually began to accept that the Earth is a globe which orbits the Sun during the 1700s, and by the Industrial Era, the prevailing theory was the one we are familiar with today. A small minority, however, held on to the belief that not only are we at the center of the universe, but also that the Earth is flat. The seminal flat Earth work was Zetetic Astronomy by the English writer Samuel Raubotham. Thank you, England, this is all your fault. Raubotham conducted the Bedford Level Experiment, in which he placed a telescope eight inches above the water of the Old Bedford River, a flat canal, and had a boat row away from his position with a three-foot flag placed atop it. Raubotham's argument was that if the Earth was curved, then over the course of that six miles, there should be about 11 feet worth of curvature. But what Raubotham observed was that as the boat rowed away from him the whole six miles, he never lost sight of the flag. Therefore, the Earth must be flat. He used this experiment, as long with some scriptural arguments, to write several works, I won't call them books because they're not all books, but several works between the years of 1849 and 1865. These works included Zetetic Astronomy, Earth Not a Globe, and The Inconsistency of Modern Astronomy and Its Opposition to the Scriptures. And his cosmology is likely very recognizable, an early version of the map used most commonly by Flat Earthers today. In his work, he presents the Earth as a flat disk with the North Pole at its center and an ice wall surrounding the outer edges, with the sun, moon, and stars only a few thousand miles overhead. If I remember correctly, because I neglected to write it down, he said the sun and moon were 3,000 miles overhead and the stars were 3,100 miles overhead. At this point, you may be wondering, well, is it possible that Raubotham was a con man, that he was saying all of this to publish books to the feeble-minded or something like that? But I must tell you, Raubotham was a man of impeccable character. 
This is a man who chose to go out of his way and provide charity by taking in a 15-year-old girl as his wife. I mean, this is a man who responded to the question of why do ship's holes vanish before their masts as they go over the horizon by literally running away from his own lecture, allegedly. Allegedly. Rabotham's suggestions, his, his writings, didn't, didn't really attract that much attention until 1870, when a man, a supporter of his by the name of John Hamden, put out an open wager to anyone who could prove the Earth is curved. The exact details of the wager seem to have been obscured by time, but in some way it seems that this was likely you had to use water, I guess. In any case, the British scientist Alfred Russell Wallace accepted, but he used a slightly different experiment. He took two poles and placed them so that the tops were 13 feet above the water level, six miles apart from one another. He then went to a nearby bridge and set up a telescope that was also at 13 feet above the water level and looked out at the two poles. And what he saw was that the pole further away from him appeared lower. Since the tops of both poles were at the exact same height above a level surface, the only way that the one further away could be lower than the one nearer by is if the Earth curved. Which, like, that alone, it's done. It's over. <laughs> it's a level surface. There's no grade. It's a canal. Yep. It doesn't move. Correct. Ah! Despite this complete refutation by Alfred Russell Wallace, Hamden continued to publish Flat Earth materials for many years, and also sent Wallace a whole bunch of death threats. Eventually, Wallace took the death threats to the courts and said, hey, please commit this guy to an asylum for both his own good and my safety. Some Flat Earthers will probably tell you that Wallace made all of this up. The overwhelming evidence is that he didn't. As for Rowbotham's part and how he responded to a complete refutation of all of his theories and the proof that his own experiment was faulty, he said it was perspective and not curvature. But the problem was that the telescope was level to the two poles. It was at 13 feet. Perspective would only take account in this instance if the top of the poles were higher than the telescope. Now, for the scientific community of the late 1800s, Wallace's experiment was all they really needed. He had shown that the Earth was not flat, that the Earth is in fact curved, and he had shown that Rowbotham's experiment, when replicated, produced results antithetical contrary to Rowbotham's theories. For the flat Earth community, however, this was not enough to convince them of something the Greeks had known since at least the 4th century BC. So they kind of doubled down, and in 1893, a woman by the name of Lady Elizabeth Blunt, once again, an English person, founded the Universal Zetetic Society. And the Universal Zetetic Society published a Flat Earth magazine entitled The Earth Not a Globe Review. As with Rowbotham, she firmly believed that the Bible was explicitly in support of a flat Earth. Her mission statement being, Propagation of knowledge related to natural cosmogony and confirmation of the Holy Scriptures based upon practical scientific investigation. Now, as you all may know, I'm something of an amateur biblical scholar myself, so I thought this would probably be the best place to start with my analysis of their arguments. For me, part of the reason I decided to take on Flat Earth was as a defense of my Christian faith, and to show the world that no matter what Flat Earthers say, the Bible is not a Flat Earth book. For those who may not know my background, I am a historian of the medieval era by training, and as a result, I've read a lot of the philosophic and religious texts of late antiquity and the Middle Ages. And one thing that is completely absent from almost all of them is any serious consideration or argument that the Earth is flat. While there were a few Christian writers who claimed the Earth was flat, or that we just don't know the shape of the Earth, the greatest minds of the Church totally rejected a flat Earth. Perhaps the most famous and relevant example would be Thomas Aquinas, who, in his commentary on Aristotle's physics, wrote, The fact that the Earth is spherical is demonstrated by natural science by a natural method. It could furthermore be demonstrated in astronomy from the figure of the lunar eclipse, or from the fact that the same stars are not seen from every part of the Earth. And the agreement between Aquinas and Aristotle is not a retcon. It is not a response to changing scientific beliefs, because Augustine of Hippo said similar things. In Augustine's 5th century literal commentary on Genesis, he refers to the Earth as a globe several times. He does this at least twice directly in Book 1, Chapter 25, and again in Book 10, Chapter 8. 
Taken together with the many other works of late antiquity and the Middle Ages, one can reasonably conclude that early Christians, who were surrounded on all sides by Greek philosophy, logic, and all of their other traditions and paradigms, believed the Earth to be a sphere. And so the question I had in approaching this segment is why, in the face of all of the evidence, do flat earthers still cite the Bible? Well, an early example of this argument can be found in Professor Orlando Ferguson's map of the square, yes, square, and stationary Earth, published in 1893. Now, this map was an ad for a book he was selling for 25 cents, which he said would give you essentially all the secrets of the universe, uh, and it said that there are 400 Bible verses which support the flat Earth and reject the globe theory. Located at the bottom of that map are a set of Bible verses, a, a series of examples of what he would be covering in his book. Each verse is implied to show that the Bible presents a flat Earth cosmology, but upon closer inspection, one will realize that all of them are being wildly misrepresented. He first cites Exodus 17, 12, specifically the clause reading, and Moses' hands were steady until the sun went down. He seems to be implying that because it is the sun that appears to move, then the sun must be rotating around or over top of the earth, even though the sun going down can be fully explained using a heliocentric model. And I want to point out that a lot of the argument here from the Bible is interpreting the Bible in one direction and pretending it can't be interpreted the other way. Sure, you could interpret Exodus 17:12 as saying it was the sun that was moving. But you can also interpret it, Exodus 17, 12, as saying that night was coming and the earth was rotating away from the sun. Because the sun's position in the sky is not the important aspect of the verse, using this as if it's somehow directly correlated or the correct cosmology is ridiculous. The next verse used is Joshua 10, 13, specifically, so the sun stood still and the moon stopped, which suffers from the same issue as the previous example. Nothing about the sun stopping overhead in this verse implies that the earth is flat or stationary. The language is describing an event as seen from the earth, so the sun only appears to stop is a perfectly reasonable alternate explanation or interpretation of the verse. These biblical arguments only work if the interpretation given by the Flat Earthers is the only one which could reasonably make sense, and in these two verses, it's not. Leaving aside the myriad issues with a literal interpretation of this verse, there's no reason that it only works on a Flat Earth model. This is because the Earth, going by Flat Earth rules, isn't actually spinning, so there would really be no consequences if the Sun and Moon stopped rotating overhead, especially if it was just for a few hours one time. In any case, neither of these first two examples directly addresses the shape or substance of the Earth, but he believes that 1 Chronicles 16.30 does. Reading, Tremble before him all the Earth. Indeed, the world is firmly established and it will not be moved in the New American Standard Bible. It is implied that this means the Earth is a stationary, immovable object. Now, rule one of interpreting the Bible is don't take verses out of context. And the context here is crucial, given that this is a prayer of thanksgiving and not meant to be taken in a literal sense. It's meant in a metaphysical sense. This is not a statement that the earth doesn't move, earthquakes having been recorded earlier in the Bible, but rather it is an exaltation of the establishment of Jerusalem as the resting place of the Ark of the Covenant. It's literally a prayer of thanks, remarking that the people of Israel will not be driven from their lands and will retain them through God's protection. Psalm 136.6 is next, reading, to him who spread out the earth above the waters, which of course must be read with the understanding that Psalm 136 is a poem. This is metaphorical language, not a literal description of how the earth was formed. And either way, if you look at what's said, it's hard to understand how this is a refutation of the globe model. Why on earth would spread out only apply to a flat planet and not a globe? And if you consider what above actually means here, it's not saying that the water is flat, at the bottom of everything, and the rest of the stuff is above it. It's saying that in terms of elevation, it's higher. There are things that are underwater that are above other things that are underwater. In fact, there is water that is above the water. It's just gaseous. Ferguson goes on to cite Isaiah 12.10 as the sun shall be darkened in its going forth. But Isaiah 12 only has six verses. He meant Isaiah 13.10, which is typically translated as, For the stars of heaven and their constellations shall not give their light. The sun will be darkened in its going forth, and the moon shall not cause its light to shine. This is, of course, a prophecy and not a description of the cosmos. 
And what the prophecy is describing has absolutely nothing to do with cosmology at all. It's talking about the destruction of Babylon by an army from far off lands, later revealed to be the Medes. The same event is actually described in Daniel 5 and 6, but without any of the details about a darkened sky, because that's about the city itself being taken, and it also doesn't focus on the combat, or what's going on outside, it focuses on the warning of uh, what's going to happen. In the sake of Isaiah, however, given that it's prophecy, a literal reading is simply not necessarily the best course of action. But even if you do take it literally, there's nothing in the verse that constitutes a refutation of the globe model. The argument seems to be that because the sun is described as going forth, that means it's not us moving around it. But once again, everything is being described by people on Earth who are observing things from Earth, and thus it's going to look like it's the sun that's moving, even if it's not. Like, relativity seems to be a really big problem for the Flat Earth community. Not just the theory of relativity, but really any relativity in general. If anything, this verse seems to be a prediction of something like a lunar eclipse, or perhaps a volcanic eruption, the latter being the more likely, considering that verse 9's language reads, to make the land a desolation. An eclipse would not cause desolation, but a, a volcanic eruption certainly would. So while it's unclear to what Isaiah is referring, at the end of the day, the same issue takes hold. In no way is this exclusively possible on a flat earth model. In fact, it can be explained in a way that doesn't even involve outer space if we go with volcanic plume. Following Isaiah 13.10, which I will remind you he cited as Isaiah 12.10, despite the fact that Isaiah only has six verses, he moves on to verse 11.12, in which he notes it makes reference to the four corners of the earth. Once again, in context, this is not a claim that the earth is flat or rectangular or stationary. Like chapter 13, this is part of a prophecy, and it can only be properly understood with the context given in chapters 1 through 10. In the first part of the book of Isaiah, Israel is being rebuked, both criticized and warned of a coming judgment. However, they're also given the promise that after they have been judged, they will be restored to greater glory than ever before. First, however, they will be scourged and scattered by Assyria, and then by Babylon, before finally a remnant would return, and they would inherit the kingdom. Chapter 11 specifically speaks of a period yet to come, when God will once again gather the children of Israel, Jacob, the line of Jacob, back to Judah. The language used, the four corners of the earth, follows the very specific mention of Assyria, Shinar, and Elam to the east, Pathros, Cush, and Egypt to the south, Hamath to the north, and the islands and coastlands to the west. This tells us that this is a metaphor for from all over the earth, rather than a literal description of the earth's shape. And this is made crystal clear in the Hebrew, which directly translates as the four wings of the earth, not the four corners. With these factors in mind, it's very plain to see that this verse in no way implies that the earth is flat. But he doesn't stop with Isaiah 11, no, he continues on to Isaiah 14, which contains the phrase, the whole earth is at rest, and you can probably guess where this is going. The full verse makes it very obvious that Ferguson is misconstruing the text, reading, the whole earth is at rest and quiet. They break forth into shouts of joy. In arguing that the first six words of verse seven are to be taken completely literally, Ferguson is necessarily implying that the juniper and cedar trees spoke out loud. This is because verse 8 reads, Even the juniper trees rejoice over you, and the cedars of Lebanon, saying, Since you have been laid low, no tree cutter comes up against us. What do you think, Aiden? Do you think the juniper and cedar trees were speaking with mouths? Only if the people that were looking at them speaking with mouths were standing in front of certain burning bushes. Mm -hmm. Once again, verse 7 is not a description of the earth's shape, but part of a taunt to be taken up against Babylon after they are defeated by the Medes. In fact, that information that this is a taunt against Babylon to be taken up when they are defeated by the Medes is quite literally in the chapter, right before this. Isaiah is actually where most of Ferguson's quotes come from, with chapters 29, 30, 38, 40, 52, 54, and 58 also listed. Chapter 29 is actually the one brought up right after chapter 14, but it says nothing about the shape of the earth, and there's no actual quotation involved, so I can't track down what Ferguson meant to quote. We've already seen that he tends to mislabel chapters, and that actually gets worse. But next up is Isaiah 31, which is presented, Woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord, that take counsel but not of me. This, of course, has 
absolutely nothing to do with the shape of the earth whatsoever. It seems to be referring to the fact that the northern kingdom of Israel either had already fallen or would fall to idolatry, depending on when you believe that the book of Isaiah was written. Isaiah 38 is mentioned next with, so the sun returned 10 degrees, given by Ferguson as evidence that his model was correct. Off the bat, he truncated the verse, which in full reads that it's the sun's shadow that will return 10 degrees, not the sun itself. In either case, this was a sign to King Hezekiah of Judah that God would fulfill a promise to give him 15 more years. Even taken literally, this verse in no way proves that the earth is either flat or stationary, as one could make the argument that God rotated the earth rather than moved the sun. And of course, that's ignoring the fact that God could have just pushed a cloud into the right spot. I also do want to make it crystal clear to everybody watching the video that I'm not sitting here telling you that the Bible is literally accurate to everything it says. The Bible is full of metaphor and allegory, and it may be wrong. I personally believe that it's not. So my intention here is not to say, well, what he says the Bible says is wrong, but what I say the Bible says is right, but to say, the Bible doesn't say what he says it says. He moves on next to Isaiah 40:22 and cites it as saying, It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, though this is of course yet again an incomplete quotation. Read in full, the verse is clearly and entirely metaphor, referring to the inhabitants of the earth as like grasshoppers, and to the heavens as like a curtain, spread out like a tent to live in. These are all metaphorical language, they are quite literally similes. Isaiah 52.5 is presented as, He that spread forth the earth, which is neither the full verse, nor is it actually from Isaiah 52 at all. It's from Isaiah 42, and the full verse reads, This is what God the Lord says, who created the heavens and stretched them out, and who spread the earth and gave its offspring, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. As with all of the other arguments so far, this one does not prove that the earth is flat or stationary, as something could very reasonably be stretched or spread out over a ball just as much as it could a table. Now, some argue that a better translation for spread out here is hammered out, but that still doesn't mean that the earth would be flat or the sky solid, as the Bible is full of allegory and metaphor. There is so much symbolic language in the Bible that it makes your head spin when you try to interpret it. Ferguson does not let that stop him, however, because he moves immediately on to Isaiah 54, 24, presented as, that spreadeth abroad the earth myself, and once again, Ferguson was off by a full 10 chapters. This is actually 44. The same issues present with the flat earth interpretation of Isaiah 42, 5 are present with the interpretation of Isaiah 44, 24. That being that this isn't something that is exclusively possible on a flat earth. Isaiah 58, 13, which as you can probably expect is correctly 48, 13, is read as, My hand hath laid the foundation of the earth, and my right hand hath spread out the heavens. When I call to them, they stand together. Now, foundation of the earth could apply to quite a few different things, including the physical makeup of the geological layers of the planet. So there's really no reason, given the rest of the Bible, to say that this verse implies a flat stationary plane. We are finally set free from the book of Isaiah with a shift to Jeremiah 31:35, which is arguably the strongest point that he makes, in that the passage refers to the fixed order of the moon and stars for light by night. This is preceded by the statement that God made the sun for light by day, and followed by the claim that if this fixed order departs from me, God, then Israel will also cease to be a nation before me, God, forever. I'm actually not sure how this helps Ferguson's argument, because it would suggest that the sun, moon, and stars are stationary, and don't move at all, which his whole argument is that they do move. But another reading could simply be that all this is saying is that the sun, stars, and moon are fixed in order of their distance from Earth. Beyond that, the language certainly appears to be symbolic and is typically interpreted to mean that so long as the sun, moon, and stars are in the sky, God will watch over his people. The final example given by Ferguson is Acts 2.20, which actually brings us into the New Testament, ain't that swanky, uh, in which Peter references a prophecy given by the prophet Joel about the coming of the end times. It's predicted that the sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord comes. But this, of course, is in the context of blood, fire, and vapor of smoke on the earth. Put together, much like in one of the verses we looked at earlier, this sounds a lot like a combination of a lunar eclipse and a volcanic eruption. And it sounds nothing at all like proof of a flat stationary earth. Why do I say it looks like a lunar eclipse and a volcanic eruption? Well, lunar eclipses make the moon appear to be red, and volcanic eruptions would certainly cause blood, fire, and vapor of smoke. 
and the ash would likely block out the sun, so the sun would be darkened. Alternatively, because if the ash were blocking out the sun, it would probably also block out the moon, another possibility would be that there's a solar eclipse, then a lunar eclipse, then a volcanic eruption, which, if that happened, I actually would assume where the end times were coming. I mean, the weekend before this video came out, there was a solar eclipse where absolutely nothing happened and everyone assumed the end times were coming. Well, not everyone, but probably the same people who are mad at me for this video. As I previously stated, Ferguson was advertising a booklet which claimed that he had 400 Bible verses which quote-unquote condemned the globe theory. But if these are the ones that he chose to use for his advertisement, I'm confident that the other 384 are no more convincing. As I investigated the, the alleged biblical reasoning for a flat earth, one question I had was... Why the sudden revival of a flat earth cosmology two millennia after the western world had left these beliefs behind? As it turns out, much of the controversy of the 19th century was related to the conflict thesis, a belief held by some members of the scientific community that science and religion were fundamentally at odds with one another. The now overwhelmingly rejected conflict thesis really came into its own and was fully developed in the latter portion of the 19th century, but it began to coalesce in the earlier portion, and one example is the work of Jean-Antoine Latron. Letron, a French archaeologist, argued that the belief in a flat earth was upheld by medieval churches and that this was done out of a belief that the Bible says the earth is flat. He expressed his criticisms in On the Cosmographical Ideas of the Church Fathers, in which he used the work of several Christian authors of late antiquity in the Middle Ages. The text, however, is riddled with inaccuracies and misrepresentations. Letron cites the 6th century Christian author Cosmos Indicopleustes and his work Christian Topography as evidence that the early church, that the medieval church even, believed in a flat earth. But the problem is, he fails to recognize that Christian topography was never really accepted by the church. It was never popular. In reality, Christian topography's flat earth cosmology had very little impact on a church and people who, when educated, firmly believed that the Earth was a sphere. At this point in history, the real subject of debate, as I previously mentioned, was not the shape of the Earth, but its position in the universe. And in a very ironic twist, Latron actually criticizes Diodorus of Tarsus, Severus of Gabala, and Eusebius of Caesarea for claiming that there was a heaven beyond the heavens. What these men said was that Earth was surrounded by a lower heaven, which is visible, and that beyond that was another heaven, which was larger and not visible. Of course, they were right, considering that the atmosphere forms a visible blue sky above us, and then there is the vast expanse of space beyond it. It's also possible that they were even more right, and that they were talking about everything up through the mesosphere as being the actual visible heavens, and then everything from the mesosphere out into the exosphere being invisible heaven. Would all still be part of Earth's atmosphere, but visible and invisible. In looking at the works of men like Latron, one could argue that the modern Flat Earth movement developed as a response to anti-religious and anti-dogmatic efforts from the scientific community, but it's kind of hard to draw any direct connections between Latron and uh, Raubotham. You know, there's I, I don't know that Raubotham ever read Latron. And that's what brings us to the modern contemporary Flat Earth movement. Whatever the impetus for the resurgence of Flat Earth cosmology was, it did take root within a small and passionate minority, particularly in England, under the leadership of Lady Elizabeth Blunt. So, the work of Raubotham and the Zetetic Astronomers, and then later on Lady Blunt and the work of the Universal Zetetic Society, eventually piqued the interest of a sign maker by the name of Samuel Shenton. And a sign maker back in the 1920s would have been what you would think of as a basic graphic designer for marketing today. This is a person who you would hire to design and create signage. Shenton was born in 1903, and he began to take an interest in the flat earth idea when he was in his 20s. And as the story goes, Shenton's interest in Flat Earth began in the 1920s after he had witnessed the Zeppelin raids over Britain. And he thought, hey, if the Earth is moving a thousand miles per hour, then in order to travel long distances, why don't we just float an airship way up into the atmosphere, let it stay there as the Earth revolves underneath it, and then when the correct spot is beneath it, we can just lower the ship back down. It will use very little energy, and it will be very efficient and quick. And once he formulated this idea, he started to wonder, hey, why hasn't anybody else thought of this? Why has this not been done? It hasn't been patented. You know, this is, this is really cool. Of course, the reason was that 
it didn't work with the laws of physics, and engineers knew that the atmosphere moved with the Earth. Shenton, however, was unwilling to believe that he simply didn't understand the laws of physics, and instead decided there must be some grand conspiracy. And after reading Raubotham's Zetetic Astronomy, he was convinced that the man was on to something. However, Shenton felt that the Zetetic societies didn't really focus enough on science, that yes, they were right about the scriptures, but that wasn't going to be enough to convince the scientific community. They needed to use practical science. Shenton then undertook to create his own version of the Flat Earth Cosmology, which still had a flat disk with the North Pole at the center and an ice wall at the edges, the sun 3,000 miles above the Earth's surface, and then a few more things. He had to address a few things, like eclipses and the seasons, which the previous models just didn't do. In order to do this, he posited that the sun cast a narrow beam of light, more like a flashlight than a glowing orb. And along with the moon, it rotated in circles which varied in size throughout the year, which accounted for the seasons. Summer in the northern hemisphere would mean a smaller circle, and summer in the southern hemisphere would mean a larger circle. The sun, according to Shenton, was 32 miles in diameter, as was the moon, but the difference between his and Raubotham's cosmology was that the moon was 450 miles closer, which could account for eclipses at least for solar eclipses. However, this doesn't make any mathematical sense, because if the moon and the sun are the same size, but the moon is closer to the Earth than the sun is, then the moon should appear, in this case with the numbers given, 15% larger, not the same size. Nevertheless, Shenton followed up on his new cosmology by founding the International Flat Earth Research Society in 1956. And his goal through the International Flat Earth Research Society was to use modern science to prove the arguments, the claims, that were mostly based upon scripture of the former Zetetic and Universal Zetetic societies. This, of course, was terrible timing, as the Soviet Union launched Sputnik 1 in October of 1957, thereby providing irrefutable evidence that things could in fact surpass the insurpassable dome Shenton said was described by the Bible. Of course, the response from the International Flat Earth Research Society was not to, you know, pack it in, revise, or attempt their own launch to prove that there was some sort of lie going on, but rather to say that Sputnik wasn't actually in low Earth orbit, it was just rounding around in circles over top of the Earth. It did somewhat help the Flat Earth cause that Sputnik 1 was not equipped with a camera, but a few years later, the Tyros 1 satellite was, and it took a picture of the planet from space. It should be mentioned that Tyros-1 was not the first craft to take a picture of Earth from space. In 1946, a captured V-2 rocket was used to do that from within the atmosphere, just at the edge of space, and then another satellite took one a few years uh, before Tyros-1, but it didn't really turn out. So, when Tyros-1's images returned to Earth, that was really the first time we got a good glimpse at our planet from orbit. Not from the atmosphere, not a shoddy image, but a true picture of the Earth from orbit, from space. It wasn't the whole Earth, though, so Samuel Shenton maintained his stance even with 1961's first orbital flight completed by Yuri Gagarin of the Soviet Union. You might sit there and argue, hey, well, the Soviets were just lying. They were just trying to freak NATO out, but uh, Al Shepard completed a piloted space flight a month later. The difference between these two flights was that Yuri was not piloting a spacecraft, he was simply up there for 108 minutes while it went around the planet. Whereas Al Shepard's Mercury Redstone 3, nicknamed Freedom 7, was piloted but did not actually complete an orbit of the Earth. The United States wasn't all that far behind the USSR, however, and in February of 1962, NASA put astronaut John Glenn into orbit. John Glenn's orbital mission posed a significant problem for Samuel Shenton. NATO and the USSR had now both claimed to have put a man into orbit, so were they both lying? According to Shenton, yes. But by 1968, in the face of mounting photographic evidence from the Voskhod, Molnaya, Lunar Orbiter, and Surveyor missions, as well as the ATS and Dodge satellites, Shenton finally offered a path to concession. Shenton was a man of science, at least in his own mind, and he wanted to be perceived as somebody who made decisions, made his beliefs based upon the facts presented to him. To that end, he said that if Apollo 8 returned, and Apollo 8 was ongoing at the time, if Apollo 8 returned with photographic evidence, he would accept it. There were a few stipulations, and he was quoted as saying, if they show us a very clear picture of the Earth from space, and the picture does not show all of the continents, and the edge of the picture is out of perspective, then it will prove that the Earth is round. Basically, if you show me a photograph, and Earth is in the middle, and space is to the side, and I can't see all of the continents, 
then that means the Earth must be a globe. We do also get some important information from that same article from the AP, in which he says, if the Earth is a planet, it would have to be traveling around the Sun at a million miles per hour, and we have never had evidence that the Earth is moving around the Sun. Of course, this whole full-color image by Apollo 8 thing was kind of a moot point because both the ATS and Dodge satellites had already, by this point, produced full images of the entire Earth from space. And they fit the stipulations. You could not see all of the continents, and the edges of the picture were black. Earth was in the middle. Both of those photos were released exactly 30 years before I was born. Regardless, on December 21st, 1968, the Apollo 8 astronauts took a picture of the Earth from space which fit all of the parameters given by Shenton. The only possible shortcoming here was that a tiny sliver of the planet was in shadow. Due to the position of the spacecraft, which was not directly between the Earth and the Sun, but rather slightly to the east, there was a shadow over the eastern Atlantic. Basically, everything east of the prime meridian appears to be in shadow, but you can still see probably 95% of Earth in the image. The reason for this, of course, is that it was just nighttime in Europe and Africa. Like, th th that's it. The mission produced a few more photographs of the Earth, some parts covered in shadow, but with enough, enough there to see that it's definitely a globe, at least for any person with a functioning brain. But Samuel Shenton was no such person. As you might expect, rather than simply admit that he had been wrong, Samuel Shenton instead insisted that the USSR and NATO were both lying because, for some reason, they want us to think the Earth is round. He didn't change his opinions when humanity landed on the moon a year later either, despite all of the video, photographic, and testimonial evidence. Astronauts, he claimed, are hypnotized into believing they go to space. Even with their training, those chaps wouldn't have the nerve to be fired off on top of an explosive, a rocket, and the lack of observations they bring back is negligible. Now, I will say that describing a lack of observations as negligible in this context actually doesn't make any grammatical sense, but even more importantly, uh, but these guys were often fighter pilots. Their entire job was to strap themselves to a jet with guns. Now, of course, piloting a jet and piloting a Saturn V are a different thing, but come on, man. And before anybody says it in the comments, because I know you will, the moon... It, 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 we landed on it. It happened. If you people insist on making me do a video on the moon landing conspiracy, I will do so, but I will also say that Buzz Aldrin just does not seem like the kind of guy to lie about that. And before you take what was very clearly just a joke and make it into something serious, like a certain somebody tried to do when we covered his Tartaria nonsense, that was a joke. Me saying that we landed on the moon, however, was not a joke, and if you challenge me on it, I will make a video. Actually, you know what? Even better, if you want to see the moon landing video, I'll make this very easy for you. Uh, just comment moon. In any case, the same article which quoted Shenton as saying that for some reason they just want us to think the Earth is round, uh, it also says that Shenton may be the last flat Earthist, Earthist, not Earther, in the world. But as you all know, that was wishful thinking. That's because Samuel Shenton was the archetype for the modern flat Earther, a man so overconfident in his own intelligence that no amount of evidence could ever sway him. He was convinced that his understanding of both theology and science outstripped that of men of the cloth and men of the lab coat. It didn't matter that he had been proven wrong by his own parameters, or that the overwhelming majority of theologians agreed that the firmament of Genesis 1-7 was never a solid dome. And that's something I want to quickly address. The word that appears as firmament in some English Bibles comes from the Hebrew word rakia, and rakia is better translated as expanse or to expand. Firmament in English language Bibles is a result of St. Jerome translating rakia as firmamentum in the Vulgate Bible. The Vulgate was a 4th century translation of the Bible into common Latin, the Latin spoken by the average person rather than the classical Latin of the poets, and it was translated primarily from the Hebrew texts available at the time, with the gaps being filled in by the Septuagint, the Greek language translation of the Hebrew Bible. Today, modern English translations such as the English Standard Version or the American Standard Bible, as well as their newer 20th century versions, translate Genesis 1-7 as God made the expanse rather than God made the firmament. It's possible that Jerome chose to use firmament instead of expansum because of the use of the Greek word stereoma in the Septuagint. Stereoma can be translated directly into English as foundation, framework, or firmament, but firmament is referential to the King James, Geneva, and Dewey Rhymes Bibles. 
Basically, the only reason that stereoma can translate to firmament in English is because of that mistranslation in the Bible. As for the Septuagint, it seems very possible that stereoma was used more in the sense of a foundation or a framework than a dome. And that becomes especially clear when you use the rest of the Old Testament for context. And what I mean by that is that when rakia is used throughout the rest of the Old Testament, it is always used in the verb form to mean to hammer out, to spread out, to stretch out, or basically to expand. And the noun form is never used to mean solid dome structure. Of course, that doesn't mean that the ancient Hebrews perceived of the earth as being a globe. It does appear that they may have perceived of earth as a flat world with a solid heaven above it, though this is not necessarily what the text itself says. It's just their interpretation of it, and there's really no need in the Old Testament for God to correct that. In an essay that he wrote on the ancient Hebrew cosmology, the late Dr. Michael Heiser wrote, I'm appalled that people who follow Christ are so easily led astray into embracing beliefs that are demonstrably contrary to reality. This level of willful ignorance dishonors God. And he was right to do so, because a literalist interpretation of the Bible is an untenable one, with many verses or chapters being pure allegory or metaphor, including the very parables of Christ himself. There was no prodigal son, there was no vineyard, there were no talents. All of these were made-up stories that Jesus Christ used to teach concepts to his audience. And to be clear, that's not me saying that the Bible is a made-up story. I'm saying that in the Bible, Christ told fictional stories. So, as we close out this video, I have to ask the question, how is it that in the face of overwhelming scientific and scriptural evidence, people in the year of our Lord 2024 still believe that the Earth is flat? That is what we will be covering next time when we dive into the 21st century and really the internet era of flat Earth belief. How did a movement that was down to, as the LA Times put it, the last flat earthist, manage to see such a massive revival with the dawn of the internet? But for today, we're going to leave it right here, giving you the history and the biblical side of things before we jump into everything else, because I needed a break and this video is already pretty long. So with all of that said, if you want to support what we're doing here at the Lore Lodge, you can subscribe to us on Patreon for just $1 a month, or you can become a member here on YouTube for $5 a month. That will get you access to the returning and revised Drunk Folklore, Drunk History podcast, where once a month, Aiden and I will sit down with a bottle of whiskey and proceed to tell you the most inebriated version of a story we can. If you subscribe to Patreon at the higher tiers, there are other fun things that you can get, like t-shirts and hoodies, but... The $1 one gets you access to the content. Speaking of content, you can get more of that here on The Lore Lodge, where we of course have our entire catalog of videos, but also our live show, The Lore Lads, which is live Sunday nights at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. We also have several under channels under the Redacted Media banner, those being the Weird Bible Podcast, The History Hut, and my personal channel, Aiden Mattis. We have a couple of other ones that will have some new content coming to them soon, but we just haven't theorized much yet. We are also in the process of getting the designs for our new partnership with Bunker Branding finalized, so soon you will have access to high-quality, American-owned, American-designed apparel that features Lore Lodge gear. And speaking of Lore Lodge stuff, you can get our coffee, Mount Pocono Perk, from Tableau Roasting Company. They also have a bundle that you can get that includes ours and Stakuyi slash History of Everything's. And by the way, Stakuyi slash History of Everything has his own coffee with Tableau as well. He's also just a cool guy. We like him. Check his content out. And if you want to get updates on this channel and what's going on, know exactly when new videos come out or what we're working on, you can always go join our Discord. It is bit.ly slash join the lodge. And uh, I think that just about does it. Yeah, we'd just like to thank Delete Me one more time for sponsoring this video. Go check them out if you want to get rid of your internet presence and make sure that people aren't buying your data without your consent. And uh, that about does it. I'm Aiden Madison. Thanks for stopping by the Lore Lodge.